All right, uh, Victor Ramirez is the John Smith of Latino names, so if you Google me, it's all right, just like Victor Ramirez WordPress and I'll show up. Um, cool, so this talk was, uh, this was the title that I used that was like the catchy headline, uh, but just, I could tell by the room that I scared people away. Um, so it's, I would just want to preface, it's not scary at all. Um, the talk, if I could have put a subtext below it, was like what I've learned in enterprise that can benefit everyone, right? So I'm gonna keep this simple. Um, but if you are a developer, uh, you will gain some great insights from this. Um, so what do I mean when I say enterprise? So I am the lead software engineer at Dow Jones, and I'm currently on the Wall Street Journal editorial project. Um, and I didn't have a job there a year ago. Uh, about a year ago, they recruited me, uh, and they had said, they came to me and said, do you want a job? I said, no. Uh, then they said, well, what if we tell you about the job? And the job is to unify uh, our WordPress systems, not only starting with the Wall Street Journal, um, but across all our publications in uh, Australia, the UK, South Africa, Bangalore, uh, all over the world, uh, and to have a unified WordPress system and set of tools. So I was like, okay, cool, I'll take that job. And, and it pays. So yeah, uh, money's important, right? And uh, so I'm also the founder at an abstract agency. Uh, that's my small little... Uh, WordPress uh, marketing shop, I still have it. Um, and that was, you know, when I worked at Dow Jones, I said, hey, I still wanna be able to be involved in the community and give back the way I'm kind of doing this now. Um, and then I'm a mentor at Thinkful, Code Nation and All-Star Code, which is I teach kids and adults to code uh, in various ways. So this has kind of helped my job and helped me kind of um, uh, distill things for people to really get it. Uh, and then finally, I'm a co-organizer at WPMYC uh, Meetup and WordCamp NYC this year. Um, so yeah, so that's me. Um, and then besides going on My Talk Rocks, I would love if you went on Twitter or Instagram. Uh, so if you like something, if you quote it, if you whatever, I would love if you tweet it at me. It helps me let me know that people are liking what I'm saying uh, and getting it. If you don't get it and you start to fall asleep, I will catch you and I will uh, change course and try to make it more entertaining. Um, cool. And then finally, this is one of the things I have to say now. This is 100% my personal and professional opinion, nothing I say or present today has anything to do with News Corp or any of its subsidiaries and whatever a legal person would say. I have to put that there just so you guys know, okay? Um, cool, lawyers are happy. So uh, this, uh, and everyone's, this meme probably would've been funnier last year, uh, but, and Game of Thrones, it's ending, boo. I hope to make it home tonight to see it. Um, but this was the kind of like the crux of the problem at the Wall Street Journal uh, and for our new future uh, CMS we are going to be using Gutenberg, uh, 100%. Uh, and Gutenberg, uh, you know, aside from being part of the new WordPress uh, 5.0 and beyond, um, it's modern JavaScript. Uh, and if you're working in modern JavaScript, who here, by the way, works in modern JavaScript, like with Node, React, et cetera, raise your hand? Kind of, okay, cool, I see some like half hands. All right, perfect. It, it, it can be complicated. And if you're a PHP developer um, trying to move your way into JavaScript uh, and React, uh, the, the, the wider you go and the more applications you're working on, uh, it can get really complicated to maintain because uh, it's changing so quickly. Um, so what I'm gonna cover, um, I'm gonna talk about how to think about standardization. One of the solutions um, to solve as you go and you try to work in modern JavaScript development um, is standardization. And I would say there is some standardization in the WordPress space, uh, but there needs to be more standardization if you want to succeed with modern JavaScript development. Um, the other thing I'm gonna cover is, I'm gonna share some examples of real problems I've encountered uh, working uh, in enterprise uh, JavaScript and WordPress and how I solve those. And then finally, I'm gonna give some basic tools and recommendations uh, that are, uh, that whether no matter if you're, if you're not a developer or if you're someone who works with developers or you are a developer, uh, you can use these to uh, standardize your processes uh, and really succeed uh, with Gutenberg. So, uh, this is just a preface for non-developers. Uh, does everyone know what CICD is? Raise your hand high if you really understand CICD. Okay, two, three, perfect. That's perfect. Uh, who, when I say CICD, who has no idea what I'm talking about? Raise your hand high and proud. Perfect, okay, cool. So uh, CICD is a buzzword, but it also is a real word, and it stands for Continuous Integration and Deployment. Um, and what it actually means is, Imagine that you, if, and everyone here I'm assuming has written a blog post or used WordPress before, right? Um, so imagine if you, every time that someone wrote a blog post and they forgot a headline, they forgot the SEO keyword, they forgot to spell check, they forgot to do any of those things, when they went to click publish, it was rejected. 
and a notification came up and told them everything they forgot to do, but it saved it as a draft. That's what CI CD is for code. When a developer goes and submits their code, a series of tests, so this is like our little developer friend, uh, and he submits his code, and you see the little X's, it's boo, he didn't pass it. And then he did pass the test, and then it moves to the next stage and it goes to the server. And the benefit of that is, instead of you as the senior developer, or the senior stakeholder, or the DevOps team, instead of having to continuously and make sure people follow standards, it's like a bot going and checking all these standards. And it automates that deployment process. So what that means is like it's less headaches for you. And, I'll, and I'm, as I get through standards, this will make a lot of sense. Um, and I like to call it, just for my stakeholders, I try to break everything. Because I work with a, non, a lot of non-technical stakeholders um, across many different places, many different cultures, many different languages. And I just call it automated QA on steroids. And that's what CI CD is, right? Um, so, I'm going to go through some concepts first about how to think about standards, and then it will make sense. And then hopefully it'll, it'll help you make sense of the next two sections. Um, so when you're building a WordPress website, um, the one thing that I've really pushed is that when, in my opinion, when you build a WordPress website, you want a fleet vehicle, not a race car. So what do I mean by a fleet vehicle? Um, the Toyota Camry. If you go to New York City, every single uh, Uber, uh, I'd say like 90% of yellow cabs are a Toyota Camry. And the Toyota Camry is one of the most stolen vehicles in the United States. And there's a reason for that. Um, they're twenty dollars to $40,000, which is a reasonable price, right? Um, Toyota, when they build the car, they use the Kanban process. They actually have, uh, a, and actually Kanban was invented by Toyota. So if you guys like Trello, Jira, any of those things, people don't realize this. This is literally... Before the 70s, people were just smashing rocks together and hoping things would be built. Then someone invented Kanban, right? Um, one model per factory. When they build a Toyota Camry, they only build one. They, I, think they build a, I think they build a car here in Georgia. I don't, know, I don't know, but they build a Toyota. They build a Sienna. Each factory builds one model of one car. Um, OEM standards only. When they go in, if you go and like put some crazy, you know, 30-inch uh, muffler that makes your car sound like a bass drum going down the street, you've voided your warranty and you don't get the 100,000-mile Toyota warranty, right? Um, and there's a warrantied life expectancy. So you know exactly this car, when you buy a Toyota Camry, it's going to last you 10 to 15 years, good for 100,000 miles. And that's great. And that's how a website should be, right? Shouldn't our websites, we can say like, OK, this was built right. Even if my theme breaks, I can swap out any theme because it was built the WordPress way. And therefore, like, it's easy to maintain. But that's not how people build websites. That's not how hotshot developers build websites. Um, oh, and by the way, limited specialization for staff. Throw a rock, you're going to hit a Toyota drive, uh, uh, a Toyota mechanic, right? This is how hot rods are built. They're fifty thousand to two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and you know people like to write big checks. Uh, they're built to spec, fully custom. One or two vehicles per garage, not productized. So meaning like they're only building one or two vehicles, maybe a backup vehicle for when they go and race, right? Uh, there's no standards, and there shouldn't be standards, right? If I'm trying to win a NASCAR race or win a Formula One, we have to like throw everything we can, every idea, throw some NOS in there, I don't know, pixie dust, whatever else they use, right? Um, and there's no warranty. When you go and like blow a gasket or like you know flip your car or whatever you do, you can't take it to the Toyota repair shop. You have to call an extremely specialized pit crew. Uh, and this is real math. I went and checked out how much is a pit crew. To maintain a pit crew is a half million to one million dollars a year because they're union in some states, and you can't just you can't just call them. Hey man, can you want to be my pit crew? No, you need to maintain a specialized pit group of developers. Um, and that's where I get to. Most people, including enterprise, they build their websites like hot rods. Uh, and that's like, I'm all for that if, you're the, if you have the budget. But when outside of um, uh, Dow Jones, when people come to me and they say, my budget's only $10,000 over the next two years, I put them on something like a framework, like Theme Beans or Genesis, because I say, you don't have a developer. You don't have a development team. And therefore, you don't want to have to call it pit crew to maintain it. You want to be able to throw a rock in Brooklyn and find someone that knows how to use this thing, right? Um, second, you can't just hire smart people. Hiring smart people is not a way to solve a problem. And what do I mean by that? Google this if you want to be horrified. Doctors don't wash their hands, notoriously. Um, it's a notorious problem in the United States healthcare system. It's a notorious problem in Western medicine in Eastern Europe. Uh, what they are now doing in some hospitals is they make doctors do UV spray. They get sprayed with UV paint. They have to come off and wash their hands. Now, why do doctors not wash their hands? Because they're people. 
No, they're people, they're just like us, right? They go on the golf course, they hit like 18 holes, they're feeling hot, they're awesome, they gotta get in there and do some brain surgery. So instead of doing the, the, the quick, the, they do a quick wash, right? And they think they're good, because they're a doctor, they're smart, they didn't touch anything when they came in, but that leads to contamination. And people, change, people just forget things all the time, right? Life changes, career changes, opportunity changes, financial changes, passion changes. You have a doctor and, or a developer who just, you know, they just don't care anymore, because you know, they're moving to their next job, right? So that's why you need standards. Um, the other thing is people have different definitions of standards. Stakeholders, how do we benefit? Organizations, can we maintain it? Developers, do I understand it? Users, does this meet my needs? Vendors, what is the scope? They wanna maintain that tight scope, right? And if you don't define these standards in the beginning, all of these people are not gonna be happy. Finally, the other concept that I try to push with standards is trust, but verify. Um, so uh, that just goes back to the thing of the hand washing. Like you, even though doctors, look, doctors are really smart people. They go to school for eight to 10 years, but they won't wash their hands. So when anyone says to me, we hired really smart developers. We don't need any of this. I say, doctors don't wash their hands. Did you hire a bunch of doctors? They're still not gonna do what you told them to do because that's just how life is, right? Um, so trust, but verify. Um, and for further reading, I really recommend these two books, The E-Myth by Michael Gerber and The Art of the Steel by Frank Abagnale, which is, if anyone saw Catch Me If You Can, that's actually his business book that he wrote on how to catch people stealing. And people don't, the crux of the book is, people don't steal because people are bad. People steal because of opportunity and people change. That's it. Um, so let me go through some real problems. Problem number one, no definition of standards. This is one of the first things I run into. And, and again, outside of Dow Jones, I work with other agencies uh, in New York City. I consult startups uh, and I work with some accelerators. And the number one thing I find is there's, they never take the time to define the standards. Um, and so just real quick math, you know, if you have, imagine that you're maintaining 10 uh, organization websites, right? Uh, 10 CMSs and maybe you farm it out to five different vendors uh, and you end up with 30 different developers over the course of a year, you have unlimited outcomes, right? Um, and that's dangerous. Uh, so one of the things we did was we went and internally, uh, you need to internally define standards. So for example, and people always say, well, are developers gonna define the standards? Well, which developer, right? And, and if you're not a developer and you need to define standards, work with a developer to define the standards, but don't just let them go carte blanche, right? Um, and the same thing, Toyota doesn't let the fact, the uh, parts that the, the part companies define the standards, they define the standards, the OEM standards, and they say, this is how our mufflers fit, this is how this fit, this is how this fits, right? Um, so the solution for us is uh, an SME, sorry, uh, subject matter experts, which are myself and a couple other people on our team, we're continually reviewing friction points caused by bad standards uh, and adapt in sprints. So we work in sprint cycles. Every two weeks, we're going back through all, you know, we kind of did, what did we learn, Charlie Brown, and say, hey, what did we do wrong? What was a problem? It took like, we had to have three hours of conversations just to understand how this API worked, right? Um, and that's one of the things that drives me nuts. Sometimes people will give us a plugin, and they'll say, well, any developer can really figure that out. And I go, it took me three hours to figure that out. Yet, I went to Google's, and by the way, if, if you guys don't know, Google has a machine learning, uh, free open source software called TensorFlow. In about one hour, I built a machine learning bot that picked movies for me without ever calling Google. Yet it took me three hours to understand how a simple Gutenberg block worked from an agency. Mm -hmm. do, you see the, do you see that, the disconnect there? Um, ne next, uh, definitions of done. This is another problem I run into. Um, we have 10 different teams, we work with a lot of vendors, we have you know, teams all over the world. And uh, these 10 different teams built plugins and every single one of them were missing an item. And what I'm actively working on for us is what is the definition of done for a plugin, right? Uh, and this is my growing definition of a complete plugin. A GitHub repo with organizational owner permissions. You'd be amazed how many people we forget when we adapt the plugin, we don't have owner permissions on the GitHub repo. Uh, clearly defined file header. There's file headers where it's just like, you know the WordPress file header when you make a plugin or a theme, it defines what the link is and you know it says like visit here. We now have a link to our own internal intranet to say to people, hey, if you need help or you know you want, like, so you can add those things. Before, there were just generic links that went nowhere, right? Um, a complete readme for the lowest common denominator. Um, so what I always say is, and that goes back to the TensorFlow thing, I can learn machine, I can do machine learning in two hours, 
but it takes me like five hours to figure out what your plugin does, right? Um, and that's a problem. Uh, now do that times you know, 30 developers, 100 developers, different team members, right? Um, and so when I say make a readme, so we have to figure out, like, can a stakeholder look at this and understand how his team could use this plugin? Branching structure, so making sure that you know, sometimes developers, they'll commit everything to the main master branch, right? And so we define that we have a dev, a QA, and production. Um, and I have some resources if anyone's not working in that kind of workflow at the end of this. Um, but yeah, so making sure we have proper branching structure for our plugins. Um, a defined style in ESLint. So remember, I, so if you guys aren't non-developers, uh, if you guys remember I said, hey, like, if they forget a word or they forget this and they forget that, you know, have those standards. You can define a style in an ESLint org-wide and on a plugin basis so that no matter who pulls the plugin, they get your coding standards or your linting standards by default when they pull it into their development environment. Um, clearly defined directory structure. So, and, and you know, going back one slide, if you remember, we had 10 different teams. I'd say, um, out of, let's say this is like six, out of the plugins that we pulled in, uh, out of those 10 plugins, all of them only had maybe two of these, and they didn't have these. So that was like, when I joined the company, I was like, wow, that's insane, right? Um, and in growing, right? Like, what else do you need? And now we want to put, maybe put a video demonstration of how the UI works, put a GIF in there, put other things in there. Um, and the solution, again, internally, like, every time after one of our you know, sprints, we're actively going and looking at it and saying, like, okay, what else can we improve on? What needs to be there, et cetera. Um, problem three, trust but verify. This is a very common problem. And that's it. There's, that's the problem. People, man, they just like they just don't care. Um, and then, and there's you know, and people like it's a Friday night. We have a code push, and you know, there's a hot movie going on. You know, like Endgame just came out. People gotta go see that, right? Uh, whatever. Um, and so we have you know, we have a culture now of code reviews. Uh, we're actively we're like working with each development team and making sure we're reviewing each other's code and giving honest feedback. Um, we're doing testing, which I spoke about before a little bit, and then in that testing is integrated with our CI CD, where before a developer can even push the code into our GitHub repo, it's being tested by our CI CD system. And we're rejecting invalid pull requests. Uh, problem number four that we're running into, and this is a problem that Gutenberg is having overall, uh, so if you're interested in contributing, uh, we're actually starting to contribute on this as well, um, is maintaining dependencies. Um, who here has built a Gutenberg block, by the way? Raise your hand. One, two, that's it. Guys, it's super easy. Like, it is actually super easy to build a block. Uh, there's this great thing called uh, Create Guten Block. Uh, it, you can get a block up and running in like five minutes. The problem is keeping that block running beyond those five minutes. Uh, and, the, and, 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 and the reason for that is Gutenberg is changing so quickly. JavaScript is changing so quickly. Security is changing so quickly. Everything, and that's what CICD is, by the way. CICD is that you know, you're a big enterprise organization, something like Netflix, right? Netflix gets a call from uh, you know, one of the developers, and they say, uh-oh, there's like a zero-day exploit that just came out, and we have to solve that problem and patch the bug. And the way development used to work was, OK, get the team together next week, and then in a month we're going to talk about it, and blah, blah, blah. Whereas now, you can patch that bug, run it through all your tests and make sure it doesn't blow up your system, and in two hours patch that bug and have it fixed. That's the benefit of CICD. You're not waiting for these big teams to get together. Um, but the problem that that brings is that you have to figure out how to maintain. Uh, so let me try to think. Has anyone done Composer with PHP? Raise your hand. Composer, a couple Composer people. OK, cool. So when you, when you go and run like Composer update, right? NPM is the same thing for uh, Node, right? When you go and run that, you see what dependencies are out of date. When, and guys, if for, for non-Composer NPM people, when you guys, you know, if, you're, if you're working properly in WordPress, you go in, and WooCommerce is notorious for, this, notorious for this, you don't go update your plugins on your production site. You go to your staging site, you update your plugins, cross your fingers, and if everything works, you go update on the other site. That's what, that's what you're doing with React. React has, when you go and build a Gutenberg block, it might have 20 to 50 dependencies, and then each of those dependencies have up to 700 to 800 dependencies. So literally, you know, at one point, we're dealing with 800 to 1,000 dependencies per block. But that's not really, I'll explain why it's not a problem. Because, so if you think about it, each, um, each block is potentially its own React app. So your 10 organizations, and I'm just, you might have 10 organizations with 10 custom blocks, so 100 different configurations, right? And that's a, and so think of a, if in a WordPress site, it's a configuration. That's similar in Composer and NPM, it's a configuration. Um, 
But this problem has been solved. We got to get outside the WordPress space. So that's another thing I recommend. Get at, go to a non-WordPress conference. Go to a non-WordPress meetup. Talk to non-WordPress people. I'm very lucky. In New York City, we have a big React scene, Angular, et cetera. Um, but one of the things I found in my research was PayPal had this problem only a year ago. They just solved it. Uh, so when you guys configure, by the way, in, um, in Composer, it's composer.json. In your, in, in your um, WordPress site, you have a WP config that defines certain things. Uh, in JavaScript, it's a webpack, right? At one point, PayPal had 635 webpacks, 897 Babel files, and 5,657 different ESLints. Remember I spoke about ESLint? It's just a style file, right? That's insane. Kent, Kent Dodds, he went and said that what he said was, if, I, if we do the math, if it takes one hour to disseminate how to use that configuration and one hour to maintain that configuration annually, they're burning a lot of money, right? Now do that math. You have 100 blocks, right? Or you know, custom blocks, et cetera, or different clients. You build a custom block for 100 clients. That's 100 things you have to maintain. But the solution is to move towards a singular dependency. So um, in, if you go and develop um, in React or in PayPal, uh, they have, you can set a singular dependency. And that dependency manages all the scripts for you. It comes with a preset configuration, unless you have to do really something really custom. But most blocks, you know, some blocks are just things where like it makes a heading and it makes a paragraph and has a button. That's not really anything outside of the boundaries of standard HTML. It's not calling an external API. It's not doing any crazy like testing and configuration. It's just HTML, right? So why would you have an advanced configuration? And so WordPress actually is trying to solve this problem. They have a package called WP Scripts. And you just do npm install. You install one singular dependency. And then you never have to touch that block again. And you just update WP Scripts. You npm update and just run that one test there. And we don't even do that. We just literally have our CI CD just goes and runs it. And if we get a test back that has like it kicks back, we just go and modify whatever we need to modify. So, so that's, that's great. And if you want WP Scripts, we're trying to contribute to that. They're moving towards a single dependency to make it easier for people in the WordPress community to learn React. Because the number one problem that people are having learning Gutenberg is just JavaScript can be a nightmare. Um, problem, number, problem number five that I had, stakeholders just don't care. Um, they immediately say, like, whoa, 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 whoa. you want us to like, go and like, make readmes and make this and make that? When does the work get done, right? That's like, kind of like how client, you know, they feel about it. And luckily, again, like in my research, I was able to like, the, you know, people like Ken C. Dodds at PayPal, people at like, you know, um, at React and, and what's happening in the Gutenberg community, um, it was an easy thing. It was simple math. Um, so if you, you know, if, if you as a, uh, even like a small agency, if you're a small agency, if you're a small company, if you're maintaining, you know, five different, let's say you just have five clients, right? And all five of those clients were built with a custom underscores theme, and they have a custom Gutenberg block, and they have a custom plugin or two. If you don't maintain your standards and you try to hire, you're, and that's like, I meet a lot of people who essentially say like, oh, I can't hire anyone, I don't trust anyone. Oh, I can't hire anyone, they can't do it right. You're, you're essentially, you bought yourself the worst job ever, right? Like you're never gonna be able to take a vacation, right? And that's the benefit of this stuff. Like, you know, I just went, I went and spoke at WordCamp Madrid, uh, and I was gone for two weeks, and nothing exploded, right? And I was like, and that was awesome. And that's like, I think everyone should have that ability. And as a developer, sometimes you become such a linchpin, which is a great thing, but you don't want to become such a linchpin that you're literally overnight losing sleep about these things. Um, and then for the stakeholders, I just had to show them, guys, we're gonna have, in our, you know, in our roadmap, we might have 100 blocks eventually that are all custom. If we have 100 configs with 100 hours annually, and then we have to go and explain to every, and these vendors, you know, we work with WordPress development agencies. We have to, what, spend 10 hours to explain to these guys, like, how to use our standards or how to adapt their standards. And, you know, if they're charging 200 an hour, that's $2,000 every time we want to go and explain. So, so, you know, it's hundreds of thousands a year that we're saving. Um, so here are the tools and assets that we're building. Um, we are going to be open sourcing some of them, so follow me on Twitter. Um, hopefully at the end of the year we're going to have some of these available. But the other thing to remember is um, anyone can build these tools, just listen to Picasso. This is my favorite saying. Uh, good artists borrow, great artists steal. Uh, they're like, I did not invent any of this. I literally just listen and I'm a, like, Kotoro, parrot. Like, I just listen and I just like repeat what I hear, right? Of course I like filter it uh, sometimes, but uh, I didn't think of any of these. I just looked at what was going on in the development world, and I said, wow, I learned TensorFlow machine learning in one hour because they had a great README YouTube video and accompanying blog post. 
maybe we should make that for Gutenberg, right? Um, and so what we have done is we've created a README boilerplate. Uh, someone comes in and says, hey, uh, what are your README standards? Here you go, uh, video at the top or a GIF. Uh, this you know, has to have a heading. And one of the other benefits too of a really great README, uh, you guys may not realize this, but you guys notice like, um, the WordPress.org repository for the plugins, uh, all of them have like a nice heading, a nice text, a nice whatever. Do you think someone's manually going and writing that in? No, it pulls from the README because there's a standardized README format that is required to submit to the WordPress.org repo. So because we have standardized our README, now we have our own intranet site where any stakeholder can go in and view all the plugins that we have and assets that are available. So any developer that comes on, I just tell them to go to our intranet. Um, and then for your plugin, we have a plugin boilerplate, which includes our PHP CS, our styling, our ESLint, and other, any other configurations. So that way, when someone comes in, they fire up their IDE, they pull down the plugin, and it auto configures for VS Code or PHP Storm, uh, whichever one they want to use. Um, we have a Gutenberg plugin boilerplate that uses WP scripts, a singular dependency. Um, we have that well documented and tell people how to fire it up, what files they need to change, et cetera. We have a theme boilerplate. Uh, we do not use a framework. Uh, we do have our own theme uh, that we have a theme boilerplate uh, uh, at my company, but I prefer Genesis. So again, thinking about a standard theme or framework that you can use to build off of. Um, and then we have a CMS handbook and knowledge base. Uh, a lot of it just links to standard WordPress stuff, but there are certain things where we have different standards that we have defined. Um, and then the other thing we, you don't have to do this, but again, defining it for some smaller teams, I just recommend using a local by flywheel or VVV, but making sure you're all in the same thing. Like I get it, developers have their preferences. In my, uh, in my personal company, Abstract, I do have some people who are like, I prefer this. I'm like, that's cool. Uh, I'm not paying you for that, I'm paying you for this. And so use this standard, I, I don't, and if you have to do the work there and move it over, that's on you, but I'm not paying you for that, right? And, that, and that's like something, you know, it, it, it is, you know, you have to give some hard medicine sometimes. Um, and then these are our standard processes. Um, we have our dev workflow, which is again, when a developer commits code, it gets tested and put it into dev, a dev environment. Um, and then once that's tested there and it passes, then it goes to QA. In QA, we do uh, integration and regression testing. Uh, and then once it passes that, we go to production. Um, we use Jenkins for our CI CD. So remember I said to you guys like before for non-developers, like it's essentially some system that we'll go through and check. You could, Jenkins, is, is, it's like a scripting system. Uh, and same with Travis, you write these scripts and these commands and have it run these tests uh, and it will do those things where reject, and you, or you, it doesn't have to reject. You can have hard pass, soft pass, different things. Um, we do unit testing. Uh, regret, and again, like I said, regression testing, and that's just making sure that, oh, sorry. Uh, regression testing is just making sure that anything that you know, uh, worked before works now. Integration testing is putting it and making sure that you know, all doing actual live testing and making sure it works with everything. Um, and these are some resources. There was actually a great talk about the technical side of this. Uh, you may not have gone, but uh, one of the guys from WP Engine automating WordPress development with Chris Weigman. That guy, that actually everything I kind of learned about CI/CD, I just took from WP Engine. WP Engine has amazing resources on that, and they actually make it really stupidly easy to do CI/CD. There's an application called DeployBot. There's one called CodeShip, and um, I think some of them even have like UIs to write tests where you don't even have to like know how to write tests. You just go. You, and, and they even have consultants that will help you out. Um, and that, I put that article in there too, continuous integration with WP Engine DeployBot. But the number one thing I find, and just in closing, so many people get like, yeah, we want to do CI, CD, and React, and modern development tools, and you know, all these buzzwords, but what does that really mean, and what is the benefit, right? And so what I hope to give you guys with this talk was, don't th I'm working in reverse. I'm thinking about what are the standards that we want, and then this is actually the easy part. If you find a developer, or you work with a partner like WP Engine, or you work with a partner like Kinsta, they can help you get this together. But if you don't know why you're defining these standards, this is like the biggest waste of time. Like I actually worked with a team recently, their version of CI CD was like checking that all divs had classes. And I was like, okay, like why do we care about that? Is that really gonna move the needle? And they're like, we hate Dividus and Bootstrap. I'm like, oh, okay. Like, but that's not a business, I don't care. Like, you know, and, that, and people will just write tests for the sake of tests. But think about what really moves the needle in your organization. Um, and that's it. I'm gonna tweet the slides after this, and we're open for q and I left like 10 minutes for questions, guys, so like, please, if, I'm over, if I overwhelmed you, I'm sorry, but. Chris talked about WP Enforcer. Have you heard about it? 
I have not. I guess it's a, it's a syntax basically to put in, I learned about all this today. But yeah. Uh, I guess it's not on Git, by Steve. Oh, cool. But uh, he talked about that one. Yeah. So I'm assuming something like WP Enforcer might enforce WP standards. Or syntax. Yeah, yeah. And, and so basically, when you push it, in, you know, for for basically, uh, you know, if you're going to use it with obviously Git, um, then it basically QAs the developers code for it. You know, actually. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. And so just so everyone, because I have to repeat this because the, there's no yeah. microphone, but just so everyone knows, they were he was asking, have I heard of Git Enforcer, which I got, uh, or a uh, WP Enforcer, which was uh, you know mentioned by uh, the guy I spoke about before, Chris Wagman from WP Engine. Um, there are existing tools out there. So if you don't have like I don't know what standard to use for ESLint, Airbnb has open source theirs. They have a, we use Airbnb's ESLint. We didn't make our own. Uh, PHP CS standards we use WP. We didn't make our own. Um, we are making our own uh, you know uh, standard JavaScript standards outside of WordPress. Um, but there's a lot of this stuff has been solved. So if you find someone or you know, you know you know someone who uh, you can start there, and that's what I meant by steal. Just go and borrow someone else's uh, workflow. And a lot of you know a lot of developers are very giving, and you know they do write exactly how they did it or how you know they implemented it. The other thing I recommend though too is to get out of the WordPress space sometimes, because one of the things, and I had this conversation. Uh, here at this event with someone was that a lot of the tutorials and stuff that are being written are being written for people who are using PHP 5.2, 5.6. They're not using PHP 7, right? Um, sometimes you have to go out of the space and see what people are doing in PHP, and that really makes the difference. Because even though, you know, like what, if, if you're moving, if you're doing these kind of standards and CI, CD, and et cetera, you have the benefit that you can start to adapt really cutting edge stuff because you're actively testing and actively growing and keeping up with the, you know, the speed the development is moving. Um, but the WordPress space, because of backwards compatibility, you know, they're they're sticking with 5.2 and 5.6. But if you can move ahead and get, you know, and to let you guys know, PHP 7 is like 100 times faster. Lit literally, I'm not making that number up. 100 times faster. So if you're in a host that's still on 5, you're like, you're burning money. You know, and so um, that's why I do recommend, like, you know, try to look outside the WordPress space or look work with hosts that are, you know, just like WP Engine, Kinsta, et cetera, they're pushing the needle to get like to these higher standards. Any other questions? Um, do you do any headless React or uh, headless WordPress? So our WordPress system is 100% headless. Um, so the way that we're using, um, the way that we use WordPress uh, is that we still have the Gutenberg editor, um, but what we're doing is, uh, so each Gutenberg block stores the data in the database in a particular way. Uh, and then what we have is we have a build tool that is going and grabbing um, all of the, like let's say we have a headline block. It will take all of the blocks, map them into a kind of JSON structure uh, that matches our JSON structure for our own proprietary system and then sends it all over to all of our different systems. Like for W Wall Street Journal, we have a mobile app. We have you know Android, iOS. Uh, we have uh, desktop. We also have Pro. You know because we have paid Wall Street Journal, and then also some of our data. If you you know when you guys go to New York City and see the tickers on all like the buildings, that's powered by WordPress. Like all of our publishing is being done by WordPress. Um, the New York Post, for example, they're not um, uh, Gutenberg yet, but they uh, they use like they give you notifications via SMS or push notifications, and that's headless WordPress. Um, and so yeah, we're 100% headless. Uh, and, and the benefit for that is we, I as a WordPress developer, am building a CMS. I'm no longer bothering with the front end. And we have a crazy front end team that you know, they handle that. Uh, and they're dealing with the membership teams, and the ad tech teams, and all those things. I'm 100% focused on building a CMS that works for newsrooms. Uh, and it's a really great experience. It's a very different experience from what I did before. Um, but yeah, so that, that's how we're using it. Yeah, I keep forgetting to repeat the questions. Yeah, so the question was that we are, uh, are we using headless WordPress? Um, and yeah, we are using headless WordPress with the WordPress REST API. Um, but in what, what's happening is uh, we're going to the WordPress REST API, grabbing that data, and then in our plugin, we're modifying it to match our JSON standards. What we didn't want to do was modify our uh, object, you know, our data types for WordPress. Instead, we're modifying it on the fly when it gets published for our system uh, because, you know, 
we would have to modify then hundreds of thousands of websites. We'd rather just modify one WordPress to match our standard. Any other questions? Uh, so the craziest block that we built so far is Dow Jones uh, has a um, has a bunch of proprietary APIs, um, but one of the uh, blocks that we're currently messing with is a chart block. Um, so we're allowing people to grab real-time data um, from different data sets that Dow Jones has and then manipulate that data into a chart to display and tell a story. Uh, and that is actually way more complex than it sounds because it's not really a data problem. The API is actually the easiest part. If, and, and not to like insult what I do, um, but as a developer, once you've like, once you know how to pull from an API, you know how to authenticate, you know how, like what, you know how to manipulate the data, put it where you want it, that's the easy part, right? And then now we solve the dependency issue, so that's another easy, that's, we're making it easier. Now it's a user experience problem. What do we want to let people do, right? Um, and so uh, one of the things, without getting too heavy into the chart API, uh, we recently built a byline block. Um, so if anyone's not familiar, like a byline is like by, you know, Victor Ramirez and let's say Brett, right? And so um, when every, and we didn't build that in a uniform way. Uh, what happened was before I came on, everyone was already building it. So one agency built it where in the Gutenberg sidebar, they could search for names and then drag the name into the byline, okay? Uh, then one team went and built it where you would type a name and then there'd be a drop down of all the available names. You'd select the name, hit a plus to add another name. Okay, um, I thought that was weird. Uh, and what they were doing was they were bringing in what I the way that I saw it was ACF into WordPress because that's the that's how WordPress forms work, right? That's what I think Ninja Forms is like that. You drag things from the side. Gravity Forms is like that. You drag things to the side, right? And that's how WordPress does things. Um, but in my mind, I was like, and this was this is what made it difficult, by the way. Uh, uh, I said, well, how, how does it work in the wild? Without us having to train users, I, I didn't even get into that in here. Um, without having to train users, our number, sorry, and when it comes to user interfaces and user experience, our number one competitor is Domino's. That sounds weird, right? And I literally say this to every stakeholder, and here's why. You guys know this as web developers. Non-technical stakeholders have no concept of what the cost or scope is of a technical problem, right? So when I order, I haven't ordered Domino's in a while, but like when you, if anyone hasn't, I try, try it, just order Domino's for the kids, see this, it's pretty cool. You order Domino's on the website and there's a Domino's tracker. You literally can see when the pizza goes in the oven, when the dude has it in the car, and you can cheer him on and like even tip him extra money if he gets it in the car earlier, right? That's my user experience for a $10 pizza, right? So why, in God's name, for a $100 form block or a $500 this block or a $50,000 enterprise plugin, do I have this horrible user interface, right? So that's why I say Domino's is our competitor because people, a $10 pizza has an amazing user experience, right? So what I did was went and looked in the wild and said, what is the user experience when you're adding names to something? Facebook, at, uh, Twitter, at, uh, you know, uh, and all those other things. So um, in the Gutenberg, uh, uh, the Gutenberg package on the GitHub repo, it's not well documented. There is an auto-completer, right? And the default auto-completer in WordPress, um, in Gutenberg, if you guys go to Gutenberg right now and do the at, it goes and searches the profiles from your WordPress site, right? But we didn't need that. We want to pull from external authors, right? Because one person might be writing the story, but there might be five editors on a story, right? Um, and so what we did was, we, with Gutenberg, you can, and I had to learn this on the fly, by the way, it's not documented, um, but we disabled the standard at, right? And with the auto prefixer package that is available in Gutenberg, you can make any auto completer you want. So what we did was we made an auto completer block for the byline that when you hit at, instead of pinging the internal REST API, and that's how they get the, um, the authors, we pinged an external API just via fetch, which is a standard ES6, you know, very simple. Just fetch to our external API, uh, and as the person types it, it goes and searches all the names, um, and then they, when they find the name they want, they hit enter, and the name populates, and it goes to the next space. They want, and, and even better in Gutenberg, because we didn't expect people to know to do at, when they drop that block, you can do, there's packages to build tooltips. So um, have you guys ever like hovered over something in Facebook, and it says like, hey, do this, if you're trying to do that? You, that's available in Gutenberg. 
it's not documented again, but like we, so we went, it's documented okay, but they don't really tell you, by the way, you've seen this in Asana and Facebook, so you may want to use it. So now that's one of our requirements on every single block requires a tooltip. Um, if someone hovers for more than five seconds or something, right? And so that tooltip then says, press at to start searching authors, right? And then the other thing we did was, uh, now that byline block, we also restricted that that autocompleter only works in the byline block. If you try to instantiate or press the at symbol in any other block, it doesn't work. And that block is restricted to only be used once. If you try to use that block again, it, it's not available. It's not available in the dropdown list. Um, and that was like, now, that, I went through a lot, right? That's a lot of stuff to do. But think about that. I essentially made my own, like, Asana experience. And it was so, and we had a hackathon recently where all the teams got together. And when we demoed our byline, everyone's like, wow, we're stealing that. Like, and I was like, yep, please do. And, and now, instead of thinking about each of us making our own block, now the next problem is how do we add a filter so people can add different APIs? How do we, you know, modify and how do we, and by having standardization, we're able to grow like that. And that was a similar thing with the chart block. Because now, back to the user experience problem. Do we have a drop down? Do we have an autocompleter? That's not really, I think, appropriate for a chart. Do we, what users are, have what APIs available to them? If they're a bankruptcy desk writer, what APIs do they need? If they're a uh, mergers and acquisitions writer, what do they need? If they're just a contractor and we don't want them to have access to really sensitive data, what does that mean? And that's, that's a really complex problem because it's who's using it? Who's writing it? Who's authorized? How does it look? And those are really interesting problems you can solve now that you have Gutenberg. Because I wouldn't even know how to begin to do that in, an, in a form interface. In a form interface that would just, you know, it, it might look like a nightmare. And too many options, right? So if I overloaded you, sorry, but yeah. Next question. So I have a question about, um, have you thought, has your team thought about the uh, um, issue of content and APIs changing over time. So let's say that you have a story that uh, is using a block mm -hmm. that has an API. And then, um, I mean, it's possible that you never, ever, ever go in and edit it three years from now or five years from now. But what happens if that block's not available then? Or For the charts, OK. Yep, yep. OK, so let me, uh, so just to repeat the question, uh, I was just asked, what do you do if the API is no longer available, or the API changes, uh, or things like that, right? For existing content. Right, for existing content. Previously con written with that. Without, but with, but you're saying with Gutenberg, right? With Gutenberg, okay. with the API. It right. It worked at the time, but it doesn't now. Right. So some APIs we have no control over, and some APIs, if we tried to do this, we'd violate their standards. Um, so for example, the Instagram block, right? There's certain blocks where we essentially say, and sometimes agencies are like, ah, we don't really like the block from the default standard WordPress. We're going to build our own. And I say, hold on a second. Who's going to build it? Who's going to maintain it? What are the standards? So for example, the Instagram block, right? The beauty of the Instagram block is don't try to build a custom. Just use the standard Instagram block. It's pretty good. Like, I don't care what. There can't be a feature that you want to have to maintain that because the Instagram API is changing so often, right? But let's look at the chart API. We thought about that. We said, hey, we want the chart data live in the editor. But what's great about Gutenberg is um, there's two functions. There's an edit function, which dictates how it works in the editor. Then there's the save function, which dictates how it looks to the viewer and in your database. Right? We flatten the chart. We capture it as an image. Uh, and then we save that to the database. And that image is then forever in perpetuity available. Uh, and that, that's really cool. Because that was immediately, we had that same, that was the exact same issue to think about. What if all of our APIs change? What if our keys change? What if the site goes down? We want these, you know, this. And also the one thing, we're actually going to limit the amount of stories in our WordPress instance to keep it fast. So there will only be like 100 to 500 stories at a time. Once the story has been in there for like six months, it will get dumped and put into our, into our custom API storage space because we want the site to be fast. We don't want 5,000 posts. And if someone wants to edit an old post, they have to go into the, our, old, our system, grab the key, and they can input it and reinstantiate the story. Um, so those are like really, and that's interesting problems to solve because you have to think about that, right? When APIs disappear, when things change, and that's, I think, one of the scary things about Gutenberg. It's going to force you, and this is the one thing I say we just brought on um, some new developers. I tell them, like, you can't use Stack Overflow, you can't use Google, you can't use anything. Like, you have to literally go into the Gutenberg GitHub repo or go fork Richard Tambor's stuff. By the way, if you want to fork anything, go look at Richard Tambor's code blocks. I steal half his stuff. I bought him two drinks, so I feel we're even. But, um, uh, you know, or co look at code blocks, look at atomic blocks, look at um, 
uh, stackable. We go and look at those, and we and that and that's kind of like we borrow from. But it's a really interesting challenge, and that kind of stuff. If you think about it, what do you do when the API disappears? That stuff that we don't have to worry about right now in WordPress, really, right? Because we're not doing the React thing. If it disappears, we can like do an interesting image, but that's not predefined for us, right? Um, so yeah, so that's what we're doing to solve that. How am I doing on time? Has he got a question? I think we're, anyone have a, go ahead. The question was, what am I doing for state management? Uh, so we're just using the standard Redux wrapper, what's in there. Yeah, so we don't, no, so anything, so we're trying to really just stick to the word, my goal is to stick to vanilla WordPress. Um, so we're trying to be as vanilla as possible. Anything where we have to like pull in, like, you know, someone was like, oh, I really don't like this about the Gutenberg thing, or I don't like this, or this could be better, or isn't there a better this we could do? And it's only, I've never seen something that's 10 times better. It's always something that's like 10% better and maybe saves one of our developers 15 minutes. But the one thing is, as a, and that's like, you know, and I apologize to anyone who uses this, but like Twig Press, or not, not Twig Press, what is it called? Timber, Twig Press is someone's Twitter handle. Timber, right, or like Timber and like all these like, uh, or like, uh, Brett, help me out, what is that thing called? What are, these, these custom theme frameworks that kind of like reconfigure WordPress to be in different folders, uh, there's, uh, there, there's all these like you know frameworks out there where they reconfigure WordPress, right? And a lot of people say, you know, you'll see on advanced WordPress, people will say, oh well, like any developer is going to be able to figure that out in 10 hours anyway, right? Okay, cool. I have 100 developers, and now I have to spend 100 hours or 1,000 hours for them to get up to speed. Now, for my team, that makes an unhappy developer. They're on salary anyway. It doesn't cost me more money, but it's a waste of time. Uh, for vendors, I now have to pay that vendor money, and there's a diminishing ROI unless we're using that across all our systems, right? And then I can't go and recruit in the standard WordPress community. I have to find someone who knows this really abstract concept, right? And so that too, when any when you start thinking about anything like because I know Tribe event, the guys who have event the Event Plus Modern Tribe, they made their own wrapper for Redux, right? And that was the big conversation in advanced WordPress where Yoast and everyone else said, now you're going to have to maintain that, right? And I guess if they're doing enough business to maintain their own Redux wrapper, their own Redux, great. I don't want to maintain that. You know what I mean? I don't want to deal with that. And it's like about what, you know, what are, what's going to move the needle, right? Now, for example, with that chart system, if we had to come up with our own state management, that would make sense because Dow Jones, our money is data. We trade information, right? That's something where I'd make our own state management system, right? But you have to think about what's if it's if it's not going to give you ten times the ROI if it's like a ten percent bump, don't even don't even do it. Stick to vanilla WordPress. Um, I'm very opinionated, by the way. So if like anyone doesn't like what I say, it's fine. I'm sorry. Um, cool. <laughs> Any other questions? What are you excited about coming up next with this whole the Gooper project changing widgets, the header menus? So again, we're headless, so I'm not at work excited about widgets because it doesn't really affect us. But in my personal life, you know, and like, and I, I am excited about, um, I, I think it's really exciting because the opportunities that are there, if anyone has played with like Webflow or play, and outside of page builders, right, there's all these great web experiences. Like someone has made Doom in JavaScript, right? Like there's a JavaScript Doom, and I think it's like one megabyte, right? Uh, I heard this because YouTube was a two megabyte page, and then this, I think the guy who was in charge of the YouTube team said, Doom is one megabyte, why, is YouTube, why are YouTube pages two megabytes, right? And not even the video. Um, and that makes sense, right? So it's a challenge. Um, and I'm excited about the challenge of going and looking at um, how composition will work, right? Because you could use Gutenberg, and I don't know if this is a use case they're going to um, validate, but you could use Gutenberg to compose newsletters, right? I mean, Gutenberg looks just like MailChimp, right? Um, you could use Gutenberg to go and create, uh, you know, uh, or this is something you know that you might you could do it for print stuff. You could do it. If the limit is like you as a developer, right? And with JavaScript, uh, you know, we didn't create a custom chart API. We just use there's a, a React chart API available. There's a, a React game API. There's every if someone's creating something for React, right? TensorFlow. There's a JavaScript open source JavaScript uh, machine learning algorithm there, right? So so I guess oh so yeah. With that in mind, my number one thing is like personalization. So I really want it where like. What I love is when I go to a website, within reason, I don't want creepy like, hey, we know everything about you and buy five of these because you know you're a fatty and eat this or whatever, you're like, but fine. But like, I, w I want essentially like, you know, I, I don't like, I just like today, um, Delta said it's time to check in. I clicked the link in the email and it tried to open the app 
I hit cancel, and then I got a blank page. Went back to the email, clicked it, and it tried to open the app, it hit cancel, I had to go to Delta, find my number, put it in, right? And that's like Delta, they haven't even solved these problems, right? They're like a Fortune 100, Fortune 500 company. Um, but what that means is now we as WordPress people, we can solve that problem. I could write a simple cookie or if statement or something to go and see if someone has canceled downloading the app before or if they don't get redirected to the app to serve different content, right? And so with Gutenberg, there's this new level of personalization. So if, I, if you remember before, I was saying we restrict the autocompleter to a certain block, right? I could restrict that autocompleter to a certain user. I could restrict blocks to certain users. I can restrict blocks to certain um, IPs. I can you know, restrict to certain uh, regions, to certain languages. And so there's all this like, really amazing customization for, you know, for really rich experiences. Um, and also, once the accessibility issue is solved, um, and that's, again, that's like the editor experience accessibility issue, you could go and detect, and like you know, I told you, in the save component, you can go and save the data however you want, right? So if you save the data in a proper way, you could use it for tickers in the news. I could use it to send you know, data to uh, you know, uh, my Twitter feed or any of those things. Um, so that's really what I'm excited about, just being able to push and pull data wherever I want in the world. So not really, I guess, like the widgets and stuff, that's nice. But wouldn't it be nice that if I was like um, a store owner, someone made a widget that just went to Google My Business, grabbed the current hours, and if I put we're closed for Easter, the block updates. And that person doesn't have to go into WordPress, right? Because business, and like WordPress, it can be complicated, but I just think anything for another person to log into is not exciting, right? Wouldn't it be great if we had a block that, you know, and, and that's what I love about like Genesis, they already have like, you literally put in the, the, the time, they have like a time short code on your footer, automatically updates. Your site never says copyright 2015, four years later, right? Um, and so little things like that, really contextual data, that's what I'm excited about. The same thing for like, I can't really talk, I, there is some really exciting stuff we're doing at News Corp that I can't really talk about. But, um, but for an example, right? Like think about this, I was talking before about blogging, right? So one of the things, if you guys notice, you go into Yoast and you can set it up where it will check on, I think on save, it goes and checks like how your SEO is doing, right? Um, but imagine that you wanted to have that like where if anyone uses a word that's not allowed in your style guide, we don't allow that word, right? So immediately as someone's typing, if they type that word, you can capture it in real time via hooks. There's a hooks thing in, uh, in Gutenberg, WP hooks. You can grab it and say, uh-uh, don't use that word and have like a big alert that says like whatever. Or you could be even a goofball about it and have like, I don't know, what is that in Jurassic Park, Newman? He's like, uh-uh-uh, didn't say the magic word, right? You could have something like, you, could, you can make your experience whatever you want it to be. So it, I think the exciting thing, not just Gutenberg, because Gutenberg really is just React. The potential is limitless because what we're, back to the standardization thing, we're now, we're catching up. JavaScript's eating the world. Like that's actually what a lot of people are saying. We're now joining everyone else. Everyone's using one common language. That's why TensorFlow was originally written in Python. Now they wrote it in JavaScript. Uh, I think I just saw someone release uh, like another AI thing. It was written in you know, Python, and now they've made a JavaScript wrapper. Because they realize if you go to any high school code camp, if you go to most colleges now too, they're all moving towards JavaScript. So that standardization, I, I just think the potential is limitless. So I don't know if that answered your question. I don't know. Yeah. Are you in uh, News Corp and for, for the um, online um, websites uh, kind of looking at M stories? So that's not our team. That's the down. So we call that downstream. Like the people who are doing the websites, they're doing AMP stories. But back to so the question was, uh, are we looking at AMP stories? If everyone's not familiar, like in Instagram, there's stories where you click the story and it goes through. Google is now launching its own version of stories. So when you go and click a link in Google, it will be a swipeable story. Um, and so. I think that's kind of nightmarish because I am in my browser and now I click a link and I have a story. But there is a people, it's, it shows high engagement for both Instagram and Facebook. So with Gutenberg, you can go and build your own AMP Stories Builder. But it would have to be set, you know, you have to, now that's a user experience problem, right? Because uh, there's a, a startup that I work with outside of Dow Jones called Wibbits. And what they do is you give them, a, you give them an article and they go and find using machine learning and AI, the most important phrases in that article. And then they turn that, they match it with stock video footage or like Getty footage and turn that into a video. So if you guys ever seen Bloomberg 
any Bloomberg video that has text overlays on stock footage and news footage, that's generated by a bot called Wibbits. Uh, and all the editor does is they go in and say, that phrase makes no sense, give me another one. The bot gives another one. That video makes no sense, give this one instead. And it's doing that, right? So it would be great if we could do something like that where we read the blog post and go, based on this blog that you gave us, here's your AMP story with five images and five phrases that were the most important quotes, right? But that's something you could do now because now we can bring in TensorFlow for our machine learning. Um, we could bring in React to do kind of like you know, the modal experience of editing the story before they go to publish. Um, and so that's the kind of stuff you can do now with Gutenberg. And that's stuff people really aren't doing because they're not thinking like that. Whereas like, yeah, think, how do we bring an AMP story into Gutenberg? So. Well, there's um, XWP um, and is working on the plugin uh, AMP stories, uh, uh, the AMP plugin. Yeah. And they uh, right now are releasing the beta to also have um, stories. Interesting. In Gutenberg. But I, think, but I think the thing too is, how do you get people to do it, right? Because the thing is like everyone, guys, like how many times have you read a blog post, there's no featured image, there's no SEO keyword. That you got it, you, you have to make the user experience easy for people to do it. Like, and that's the same thing we, even with Gutenberg now, we have it where like if you put a block quote and don't put an attribution, you can't publish. Every block quote must have an attribution. Uh, if an image doesn't have a caption with an attribution, you cannot publish. Uh, and so those are the kind of things you can do in Gutenberg you couldn't do in the standard uh, tiny MCE editor for each of those individual components. So, cool. I think it's time, right? Yeah, All right, sure cool. Like diet or like that. All right, thank you so much, guys. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I'm gonna post the slides.